All right, Eric, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation. It's from the pages I sent you, but then I kind of want to just get uh, your thoughts on what to do next. Okay. So we're talking about starting a society and uh, for the sake of uh, having um, our knowledge from the past, like, you know, handful of uh, thousands of years, I, uh, there's a hypothetical that makes it so we're not going back to when somebody would start a society. So we got um, a natural disaster takes place and wipes out all of Earth except for North America. So we have um, we have Canada, U.S. and Mexico and everything else is underwater and there's three million people left on Earth. But the disaster kind of wiped out everything. So everything man-made is kind of destroyed. There's uh, there's no cars. There's no guns. There's no buildings. Everything just got destroyed. But somehow 3 million people survived. Um, and then now people are just essentially living in the wild. There's all these animals out in the wild. There's people in the wild. Everybody's trying to survive. Uh, some people probably group together a little bit, get in groups of like 20 or so. Uh, families are together, but there are there's no society with any structures or laws. So it'd be building a society from scratch. And what I want to work towards is okay. going over the handful of the f- most important things to do um, for building a society. Even if you would like have like 50 or 100 laws kind of all at once. Um, I like the idea of going, breaking it down to what's the most important and what uh, people need that makes it worth being under like law and order versus being out in nature. Okay. So, <clears throat> hold on. Uh, so clarify what it is you're asking. Um. So what, so, okay. So you're, you're one of these people out in nature and like you're witnessing people getting killed and rapes happen and people stealing food yeah, from the, each other. The law of the jungle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I guess the idea would be if you could group some people together and tell them, hey, we should start a society. We should uh, have laws and and so on and mm-hmm. so forth. Like what would be the first things you would tell them? Like what's the most important reason to start a society? If let's say you had a thousand people together and they're saying like, okay, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Let's say they all have amnesia. So you remember everything from before this natural disaster, but uh, none of them have been convinced uh, what, like what's going on or why they should start a society. Any, any new laws would be completely new to them. The idea of like, they, they will have never heard of a prison or anything you would have to explain why to do things okay um i would start with trying to gather up these people and try to get them all to cooperate on this right uh work is evenly handed out to the people who can handle it people who can't are taken care of um you know kids are raised uh communally because it's better for them we would all have to kind of work together to build shelters and things like that. So no hoarding would be a big no part hoarding. of it. Okay. Like you could be properly compensated for things, but like don't go out and steal shit because yeah. it's just scummy to do in a time when resources are mm-hmm. Um, Don't kill each other, at least not unreasonably. If somebody tries to break you or if somebody's trying to kill you, you have every right to defend yourself or defend someone else who's in that situation. Okay. But uh, you know, so... you can't just go out wild west dueling in the streets. For sure. Okay. So everything before the killing, um, I was thinking that it was more of a recommendations for what you guys all should do to oh. I'm trying to I'm, I just have to turn off my video and turn it back on. Oh you're good. Um, so I got the vibe that everything before the, the no killing was recommendations for if we do this, it will be better off for it. And then once it got to the killing, um, I got the vibe that that was more of a law. So, um, so I'm curious if everything before the killing part would be law. Like if you got, you would say, Hey, let's get everybody to agree to this. And then if they don't do their fair share of work, then they broke the law and they get in trouble for it. Um, I think hmm. 
I think that you could. I think that I might. It would be like, you know, it's kind of hard to properly legislate. Like, don't be an asshole. That's kind of <laughs> right? hard to do. Um, hmm. I think that a big part, like a cornerstone of it would be, you know, stopping people from stealing from one another, uh, making sure that people are properly compensated for the work they do, making sure that if somebody feels they aren't, they have a right to express that. Um, okay. Is there you know, like, so would the workers protections in the most basic sense of work? Okay. So would, a, would you need to build a prison at this point? Um, yeah, probably, because if you don't have a prison, the only justice is frontier justice, and that's not what you want. For sure, for sure. Right. Okay, so, so you would have to find some way to cordon them off, whether it be exile or imprisonment. Not for any kind of really long term, because it's not really viable in a situation like that, and because long term solitary imprisonment isn't good for people. Um, yeah, for sure. It would just be punishment. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. And then, um, okay, if somebody kills somebody, they go to prison, and uh, that's more long-term? That could be. Well, that would probably be something that you would get exiled for over prison, because if you only have, like, a small group of 1,000 people, you've got enough space that you could kick people out and keep them away from where you Would yeah. you want to send somebody that you know is willing to kill innocent people? Um, to like kick them out of your borders essentially, and then and then they might go and kill somebody else, or would you would that factor matter? Um, the factor would matter, but if you live like if you're living in a time like that, you kind of have to look after your own group, you don't really have the the um, uh, with the luxury of saying like well you know if we throw him out into society he might hurt someone else mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's there's not a lot of us and if somebody starts picking us off there's not much we can do and unless mm -hmm. we can find a prison we don't really have a viable situation for like long-term imprisonment um for sure so i think that exile would probably be okay you'd have to take them pretty far from your own borders or you would have to find a way to properly imprison. That one's a little complicated, and it kind of depends on, like, if you live in the forest or if you live in the desert. You know, there's there's different outcomes for both of those. Gotcha. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, gotcha. Okay, so I'm picturing this all playing out. Okay, so one of my first questions I have for you is... Um, so you outlaw killing, like intentional killing that um that, that... isn't an act of self-defense or defense of Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so what would you say if in this society there's no there's nothing like um adoption or foster care or anything, what would you say should there be some wiggle room for a parent that feels like they can't feed their uh children uh to kill maybe an infant? Like if, um, if somebody kills not, a... in a, not in a group that would be communal, right? If everybody's working together, kids are being raised uh, communally, then that means that everybody comes together to work to help raise the kids and make sure they're socialized, make sure they're fed. Okay. So no, but if you live like if you were to take our society and just thrust it into that kind of time where everybody thinks that you know, two people have to raise a kid alone and all that, then mm -hmm. I would have different views on that. <laughs> okay. Well, so let's say in your group, let's say you got a thousand people together right now. And uh, at first they wanted to live communally. If a couple people go, ah, I don't really want to help raise anybody's kids. Would you say, okay, well, this community is for this. So if you don't want to, you have to get out or would well, you no. just start? So if you have a thousand people, Right. There are going to be people who don't like kids or who aren't good with kids, and that's fine. It's just that, like, not every single person has to be part of that kid's life. But as long as there's a bigger group of people that are helping take care of kids, like uh, traditionally, it was the mothers would come together and kind of raise each other's kids together and they would pass them around and they would be everybody's mom. Right. Gotcha. There would be people who didn't want to be involved. And as long as there's enough 
people who do want to be involved in that and help raise kids. It's all right if a big portion doesn't or if, or if a small portion doesn't, as long as there's enough people. So there could be, let's say it's it's evenly split, guys, chicks, 500, 500. And they all end up having kids at some point. If there's, you know, 500 kids, then yeah, everybody has to be part of it. But if there's only, you know, a hundred kids, two, maybe one or two hundred people could easily communally raise those kids. You know what I mean? Gotcha. It just well, let, it's it's let's, that proportion. Let's let's figure out what would happen as soon as the numbers got too high. So like what if they couldn't? And uh like so if the numbers got too high, like there wasn't enough resource for the number of kids that they had, mm-hmm. uh, there's a couple of things that could happen. You could try to migrate, expand, or population control. Population control probably wouldn't happen at the kids level. It would probably happen at like an elderly level, or maybe uh, middle-aged people would decide they want to leave and start their own splinter groups, or you could try to make uh, interconnected communities, um, other things like that. But I mean, you know, it's it's the jungle, essentially. Right. So if somebody can't take care of their kids because they can't get enough resources together or if like everyone can't come together and get enough resources, that's when people have to come together and try to decide, like, who has to leave or how are we going to make in bigger interconnected group of people? Gotcha. Because a thousand people are already going to have to spread out quite a bit anyway. So mm-hmm. you could have, uh, you know, ideally you would start farming so that you could have more food, and, like taming animals and things like that. That can only get you so far. Gotcha. So you would have to have foraging, hunting, farming, things like that. And hopefully okay. all of it can go well. Enough. But historically, okay. what generally happens is people starve. For sure. For sure. Okay. Well, let me throw an idea at you real quick then. Okay. So the person that killed somebody that you guys exiled, let's say he makes his way back into the property that you and your thousand people are considering your borders. So he makes it back in and he kills another person. What happens to him? Uh, That would probably be like murder. <laughs> um, uh, like chances you know, that- are what would happen is like, the guy gets exiled. That is your chance to go somewhere else, stay alive. If you come back, you know, you're within the borders, you kill someone else, you are clearly not going to function in society. So we can either try to find a way to lock you up forever, which probably can't happen, or in the short term, what would happen is that person would kill someone and then somebody else would end up killing them for killing someone else. It's, you know, in that kind of time, you can't really afford to have just murderous people. Yeah. There's not really a good function for that. So that would just end up being like, here's your one chance to stay alive. Get the fuck out of here. And if they come back and kill someone else, then, well, sucks. It's on site. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I'm, I'm in our current time, I'm against the death penalty. But looking at a time like this, I think uh, you have to you have to execute. Okay, so now... Now that we're looking at the situation where somebody did something, they were exiled, they come back in. Now let's look at, so you have your thousand and you have your borders. And now let's say a woman with a couple kids, she has a a newborn and she has say, maybe she has a one-year-old and a two-year-old. She just can't stop having kids, Uh, but she's not from your society, but she comes into the borders of your society and uh, she kills the youngest one. And her reasoning is that she can't afford to feed it or she can't she can't figure out how to keep it alive. But she thinks she can keep the others alive. So she kills that youngest one. But it happens in your borders. If you witness this, um, I guess, what, what do you do? Um, I think that there would have to be some form of trial. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, if you have laws, you have tribes. You have to try. You have to make sure that they get fairly judged, things like that. Mm-hmm. So there would be a trial to determine what happens to her. Uh, we would probably remove the other kid from her custody because people who are willing to kill their own children aren't usually willing to stop after one. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So we would probably just add them to the community of kids, especially at young ages like that, where they won't really remember their mother all that much. Okay. Uh, it would be easier to kind of get them used to living in our community and maybe tell them when they get older what happened. But chances are what would happen is that that lady would be found guilty of like infanticide and then either be exiled, killed, or at the very least separated from her kids and then removed. You know, that kid would be taken from her custody for sure because she is a danger to this child. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, okay. Um, trying to work out a few different ideas in my head. I so so for me, I find that at that time, similar to how I'm against death penalty, but uh, at that time, if if you weren't able to restrain people that would keep killing people, you kind of have to do it. I feel similarly with um with executing children <laughs> um to where <laughs> if uh you're living in the wild you can't afford to feed a kid the the more um the more humane thing to do for that kid might be to kill it instead of let it starve to death well if you um, if you live alone and you're just struggling by yourself in society and you have two kids like either because like your your mate died or because you killed them or they were killed by an animal or you got just ditched. Right. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, it might be time to make hard decisions. That, yeah. that might be the point where like, you might have to leave that baby. And stuff. Like there's nothing. You do. Yeah. Animals so I do it all the time when there's, when they're short on, uh, on resources and people are at their core animals. So sometimes we have to do things like that in those types of situations. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I feel like the main thing that makes it different with your society would be that you have a group of people willing to uh, take over. So I, mm -hmm. I guess, I guess um, it would work out because it's essentially in your society, there is like an adoption of sorts, or at least there's a communal foster care. Um, yeah. So, so gotcha. it's communal living. Yeah. It's the yeah. way that kids were raised up until about 110 years ago. Everywhere. Everywhere. Almost everywhere. Yeah, like uh, the nuclear family is is historically a pretty recent thing. It's not healthy for kids. It's not really that old. It's not viable for a lot of people because of how expensive it is to raise kids. It's mm -hmm. just not a very good model. Uh, traditionally, like you know the the phrase, "It takes a village to raise a child." It's because yeah, that's I've heard how that, it was yeah. done. The whole village would come together and help raise everybody's kids. Okay. It's so like you, when you, yeah. you said a hundred years though. So let's look at like 1800s or 1700s in like, let's look at like the U S and England. I mean, I'm sure there's, they, they had different things where people might hang out with other people and help out similar to how some people might do now, but still in those times, in those places, there was still a uh, monogamy, right? <laughs> Uh, there was. So there's there's a difference between those things, right? Monogamy and the nuclear family aren't the same. Thing. Monogamy is just being with one person and having kids with that person. The nuclear mm -hmm. family is having kids with that person and only being the people who raise your kids. And kind of it's it's not good for like socialization because you don't get them around other kids that often. It, okay. it breeds like uh, distrust in other people. It's um. So like you would still have monogamy, you would still be their parents. They would still recognize you as their parents, mm -hmm. but everybody would kind of help out, right? Like, uh, you know, when you watch like, I don't know, Game of Thrones and you uh -huh. see there's always like dirty kids running around in the street. People would be like, hey, go fucking home. That's how it always was, right? Those kids would run around in the street and play around and everybody would talk to them like they were their parents because at the end of the day, everybody kind of was. Oh, I see. Okay. So more like just being outside. Like even in like the old West shows, you'll see that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I definitely Everybody agree. Everybody kind of helps out. So like you go over to your neighbor, like how are things going? And yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know to what degree I think it's specifically important. It's, it's tough because I guess maybe vehicles are the main reason why uh, it's hard. Like near where I live, there's cars driving fast down crazy roads all the time but like when i was a oh. kid i lived in like a, a small town and yeah i was just me and my friends and my siblings were just out and about at all times just uh 
living life, learning from uh, being out in the world. And I, I do think there's a downside to kids not being outside. But uh, but yeah, I'd be curious to see how like the oh, raising of kids was back in the day. Um, would would it would it be something like this? The so, raising of kids, like I could I could simplify it, right? It's okay. um, it's not so much like the being outside. It's just that that's usually how you see it. Is kids like running around outside, and somebody would walk up and be like, "Are you getting into trouble? What are you doing?" And like send you home. But they had authority over you because they were adults, right? They weren't just like teachers and your parents. Everybody did. And everybody kind of knew each other who had kids. So they could all kind of report on each other's kids. And to an extent, that kind of still happens, but not like it did before. It, it meant that you were like hanging with other kids more often. You were meeting with other people in the community and learning how to socialize from watching those people more often. It wasn't so like tight knit. Or it was more tight knit. It wasn't so like compartmentalized, family to family. Yeah, I guess it just doesn't. When I hear nuclear family, which I I haven't really looked into too much, I don't think of that as a separation from it. I feel like you could have a nuclear family and a town or a time where what you're talking about happens with nuclear families, and you could have one now where because of technology and people being on their their iPads all the time, uh, kids <laughs> kids don't want to leave the house. Um, but how does a nuclear family affect? Uh, so let's say the thing you're talking about where kids are out and about and um, random adults are telling them like, go home or stop picking on that kid or, you know, parenting them essentially. But they have a what mom would and be a different dad. in a society where they have like a traditional way of raising kids compared to the nuclear family is that nuclear families are like. They breed a lot of distrust for other people. They, you know, you don't want other people telling your kids what to do. You don't really trust people to do that so much when you uh, live in a society that's mostly based around nuclear families. When it's like the whole village, everybody is everybody's parents, right? It's every kid looks up to every adult. You can still be, you know, ma and pa, but everybody takes part in raising that kid. Everybody looks after them. Everybody kind of helps out making sure they're fed. It's It's a communal system rather than being like, your responsibility and yours alone it makes gotcha. it easier to raise the kids and it makes it easier for the kids to learn what it's like to exist in society because they have to socialize more often that way. gotcha gotcha yeah i okay i'm gonna look into it i just uh i just pulled up an article to uh to read about nuclear family i because i always imagine it kind of like an the opposite so i always when i hear nuclear family i mean i, I really just think of uh it the thing that pops into my head is the push towards um better ways to keep parents together so they don't like kids aren't raised by a single parent there's probably a lot to it but that's the main thing that pops into my head and i guess oftentimes i i think a lot of the people pushing it are religious so they're aiming towards like heterosexual uh parents but uh, I, I view them, the people that usually talk about it, which are usually conservatives, I view them as being the type of people that usually also say that um, kids today don't run around and play and all this stuff. Um, and they're like they they essentially they want the people that want nuclear family also want what you're describing. But I I don't know. So they they want that. But like. Like, uh, let's see, kids, kids have been getting, you know how people always point out like kids don't go outside and they, they don't socialize and they don't talk to other kids. So they're getting less social. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's not really with the rise of technology, right? Kids have always been getting less and less social because of that system. There's less trust within communities. There's less uh community like outreach there's less cooperation within the community because it's all bent down to in the nuclear family it's do you it's think your that... responsibility to raise your kid and no one else's and like if you ask for anyone's help it's like shamed it's it's weird what wait do you think that's a conservative thing um largely yes the people who fight for um like nuclear families the most generally you'll hear most people talk about it in churches or you'll hear republicans talk about how democrats are trying to destroy the family 
And yeah. it's because people are trying to, like, we're looking at studies and we're looking at historical uh, examples and realizing that the nuclear family isn't really the best model. It puts a lot more stress on families and it makes it a lot, uh, a lot more difficult financially. It makes yeah. it so that parents have even less time because they're constantly having to look after their kids without anyone's, without really very much help at all, even when there's two parents in the house. Because kids are a goddamn handful. And sometimes you really need more than two people to help raise a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, we might have to take a pause on this section so I can go talk to some people and uh, read some articles about it. But yeah, my my thought from Nuclear Family was just the idea of keep the parents together and be a part of your kid's life. I, I didn't know all this side stuff. So I'm going to look into that to see because I've never heard of that. Now, the, the side thing of parents in general – um like the typical parent you see in a movie where if somebody is like saying something to their kid, they'll say, don't you talk to my kid? Like the, yeah. this overprotective thing. I, I never viewed that as anything, anything political in any way, conservative or nuclear family or any of that. That's just a, a vibe that some people have. And I usually think of it as a bad, a bad thing. And I feel like all the conservative conservatives I know that push for a nuclear family also view that as a bad thing and a silly thing. And uh, I know a handful of conservative people that like uh, they'll, they, they might have kids and their kids hang out with my kid and they'll like take them for the day. And they're essentially, you know, parenting because the kid's over there for a while or same the other way around where I'll have a kid at my yeah. house. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I wonder if there's some kind of a, uh, not a disconnect necessarily, but I wonder if uh it's um no, they're contradictory in a way but like a lot of people's views especially politically are at some level contradictory okay. it's you know like when you it's uh it's kind of the, the same issue that you get when you try to use like the political compass you know when you take oh, a test yeah. it's got four axes and you get like like ben shapiro took it and he ended up just barely right of center down in like oh, authoritarian gotcha. side you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's, yeah, it's the problem with that is that you would need like a 3D model to properly map where people's politics are, because people can be all over the place on For some sure. like people can have contradictory uh, views on one issue. It's gotcha. it's more complicated than like, oh, it's just a conservative thing. Well, I mean, kind of, but it's also, you know, there's there's a lot of other nuances that go into it. Gotcha. Um, have you yeah. seen the movie Encanto? Yes, that movie's great. Um, the the way, uh, from my understanding, uh, most it's people. It's one of the few uh, Disney movies that I actually like. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I like it too. It's great music. Um, it's one of um, if I understand correctly, uh, for a a large portion of time, families south of say the U.S. um live like that, where there's uh the old like there's a grandma. And maybe a grandpa and then all their siblings, all all their kids, um, and then all their kids' kids. And they essentially yeah. like live They're either generation. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. We, I actually we are that. starting to see a really big rise in multi-generational households in America due to uh economic struggles. Like right mm. now, my myself and Annie, we can't really afford to live by ourselves, and we both work full time. So mm -hmm. we live with my mom, who my grandma also lives with. So there's three generations oh, gotcha. of living in the same house, and we're okay. starting to see like kids are staying home way past eighteen, which is totally normal. It's really weird that we we have like as a society decided that kids are ready to go out into society at eighteen. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still not fully developed in your brain. You're still very young. You still don't really have much life experience at that time. It's really not healthy. Yeah. Uh, like, I, a, I, I could like see it in like way. Japan or in India, especially places in Asia, uh, Italy in the, in the Mediterranean in general, you see a lot of uh, very, very broadly intergenerational homes, great grandmas mm -hmm. and grandmas and, and daughters and daughters, daughters and granddaughters. 
all living together in the same house, working together because it makes it easier to survive and live comfortably. Yeah. Well, and you have various different people uh, with your kids and uh, it, yeah, it just, you don't have to take your kids to daycare where they get watched yeah. by, by uh, people that are being paid low wages to, uh, to not pay attention to your, your kid. Um, yeah. There, there's so Sometimes many. If you're, if you can find cheap daycare, a lot of times that daycare ends up being uh, kind of sketchy. Yeah. Like uh, my mom was going to drop my sister off to daycare when she was very little. And uh, she looked in the back while they were walking her around and caught a lady hitting a baby. Ooh. Like outright. And it was a cheap place. So people didn't really ask a lot of questions. And mm -hmm. then immediately she pointed that out and said, why would I leave my daughter here? And they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe she's doing it. We're going to tell on her. And then they got shut down like two weeks later for child abuse. Oh, wow. That's wild. It's like, I, I don't like daycare altogether unless you have to put your kids in daycare. It's a lot better to have like uh, parents or uh, for, like a spouse or somebody who can stay home and watch them mm -hmm. because at least, you know, you can trust us. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, it's too expensive to do that now. So people kind of have. To yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think I think that kind of idea, I'm guessing most people that are for the nuclear family um, also would be for an idea like this, or at least they wouldn't be against it. But I'm, I'd be curious to ask. Uh, the, um, part of the uh -huh. traditional view of the nuclear family relied on um, like the dad going and working and the mom staying home with the kids. And yeah. that's part of the reason why they say that like feminism has killed the nuclear family because women work but it turns out that we can't really afford to not have everybody working for like sure that's but why uh two parent households are so much more effective than one parent house it's just yeah. a matter of income yeah for sure but so here's my guess i'm guessing and yeah i think it's good to be generous towards any idea at what they might mean but i i would guess at least a handful of people that would say what you just said where they like the idea of one parent working, the other parent being with the kid. Um, they also would like if there were two parents working and a grandma being with the kid. I think what they yeah. they like the idea of is the kid not being raised by one parent and then being in like kind of a sucky situation where they don't have any parenting because you want your kids to be out mm -hmm. in in like hanging out with their friends out. Uh, running around and learning from society but you also don't want them to have that be their only thing you want them to be able to like recognize their their authority figures as people that love and care about them and that they're supposed to learn from and so i'm guessing uh the people that want the yeah. two parents uh in the home uh, their reasoning would still work if you had like five parents you know if you had grandparents and then you had an aunt and uncle and everybody took turns taking care of each other and that's kind of what we do um so i i live in a cul-de-sac uh where my sister's a couple houses over um like in the same cul-de-sac and we have a, a six-year-old they have a four-year-old and they're they're super close but like for like three or four hours a day i have my sister's kid over here and then for three or four hours a day my kid goes over there and so yeah. both kids get well-rounded, like loving and caring from various different people without having to go to any daycare or anything. And uh, I don't, I don't think anybody that talks about nuclear family would be against that, but I also to play devil's advocate against my devil's advocate. I think um, sadly, there are a lot of people that talk about nuclear families that are very um, religiously homophobic and therefore they would be, um, they would be against, uh, you know, gay couple having kids or whatever, which I don't think is right. Um, uh, a big part of the reason why a lot of people like fight real hard about the nuclear family is because a lot of the is because of a lot of the um, weird propaganda that's been cut over the past like 50 years, like mm -hmm. the whole stranger danger stuff that really overblows the propensity of kids to get kidnapped. The um, like the the like the movies and the the instructional videos and the books that get written about like people getting taken advantage of all the time if their parents aren't around all the time there's there's a lot of that kind of stuff that has really scared people mm -hmm. so a lot of people think like if we don't 
keep it real localized and keep it so that kids are constantly being watched or monitored and like they don't really go out and interact with a lot of people that aren't their family or like close friends um it kind of they think that that's the only way to make sure they stay safe like uh, those stranger danger videos have actually been pretty detrimental to kids psycho like the psychology of kids and oh, their definitely. parents because uh it terrifies people I tell my daughter like, I don't, they to used to show us that stuff all the time. They used to show us that stuff in school every year. They'd be mm-hmm. like, if you see a lady walking around in the woods saying she's looking for a dog, don't trust her. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, a yeah. guy comes up to you, you know, run away and yell stranger danger. And it makes you really paranoid and afraid. Yeah. Of, afraid oh, definitely. But uh, this is where I think there's a misconnect and it it might be easy for me to uh, easier for me to see than some people because I don't uh, affiliate with any political party, but I feel like the main people that would be saying what you're saying are the nuclear family people, the conservatives. And, And maybe that's the thing. It's that most people are reasonable and, and have good ideas. And, um, so maybe it is a lot of people on the other side too, but it, I feel it like it might just be that I'm uncharitable in a sense okay. to conservatives, but um, you know, that's my bias. Yeah. It's that conservatives are told to not like certain things that they still like. So like a big example of that is socialized healthcare. The majority of people who would vote against it are conservative, but when you do polling, and you don't call it socialized healthcare, and you just say like healthcare for everyone based on taxes. Generally, even in the conservative vote, it still gets above sixty percent. It's still a very popular thing. But as soon as somebody tells them that it's socialism or that the Democrats want it, they've been hardwired by their political party to just go like that's bad and then vote against. It. So gotcha. there's a lot of things that if you watch a lot of like conservative media, there's a lot of things that they just get told is bad and then just get told like, don't trust this. And it, it changes month to month. So like you remember for like three months, CRT was the big thing, even though uh, nobody yeah, actually yeah. knew what that was. And they would just say that it's in schools everywhere and, and all that, but it's really not like it's, it, it's just, whatever like the popcorn term of the day. I mean, so I would say that's, that's complicated. That just but yeah, my uh, yeah, for sure. I, I think that uh, both sides or any side, if let's imagine there's only two, that both sides kind of do a, a similar thing where there's a handful um, of people that are just sheep that sense. that will um will follow an idea just because it's their side, so they're not really thinking it through. And then there's a handful of ideas that have some good points and some bad points, like the CRT, uh, element, but I, I do think, I think we uh, tend to separate people. Like I can't think of a group that I strongly dislike. I do. I sadly, sorry, my friend. I do think of like the idea of leftist. Um, when I when I think of that, like I think of what I think has gone too far with like rioting and the the idea of how we view like Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. But for the most part, I take any side and i i mostly see where most people are coming from especially if i have one-on-one conversations with people i even if i disagree with them i i get a good vibe for them and i i feel like that's kind of what we just experienced with this conversation talking about um kids and the whole stranger danger and all that stuff is i mean i own books by people that write uh, like are you familiar with uh brett weinstein and his wife uh, uh heather Heyer? Uh, vaguely. Okay. Uh, he's, he's the guy that, uh, that was kind of famous for getting, um, rioted out of that school. I can't think of the name of it. It was in like, uh, Washington. And, uh, it was because that whole, that whole thing where, um, if you, they, they had a thing where like, uh, one day a year, the black students would like go off campus and gather together to talk about some racial issues. But then uh, one year they did a thing where they wanted to make all white students not go to school. And so they are kind of reversing it and, and he uh, spoke out against it. Um, Anyways, I just wanted to get you a picture of him in your head in case you had seen him. But anyways, um, like they wrote a book. I I seem to recall that. Yeah. Okay, they wrote a book together that I really like called uh, the Hitch. Uh, what was it? The 
the guide to the uh, what was it? Um, Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Um, and the majority of the book is on this topic of uh, kids not um, experiencing what they used to and not like uh, getting out and running around and basically being cooped up because of in the 70s, there's big scares about serial killers and stuff. And uh, there's a, a, a another great book called Coddling of the American Mind. And uh, anyways, uh, that, that was by Jonathan Haidt. And uh, I have both of those books and they're they're not. um they're not conservatives. They're both, they're both, uh, you know, claim to be like liberal, maybe classical liberal. Um, but they're thought of as people that are very disliked by the left. They're thought of more in the, like the Ben Shapiro camp, but, uh, they're writing entire books about this topic. And a lot of people that I talk to like side with them that are people that are center or maybe right leaning. And, it's all these ideas that you are saying are good ideas. So it's just an interesting thing. I really think um, more humans get along and agree with each other than we realize. And uh, there's just so much division out there anyways. <laughs> well, I mean, part of the reason for the division is more that people are paying attention to what the Republican party is saying rather than like the average like Republican, I guess. Okay. Um, the problem is, at least for me, the way I see it, the problem mm -hmm. starts when you start to support people who are using like genocide rhetoric or you're defending people who are constantly trying to strip other people's rights. That's a point where I don't really have much charitability anymore. Okay. Like, for example, right, the, the, the Republican Party rhetoric around trans people is like mirror to mirror what the Nazi party would say about trans. Like the first okay. book burning that they did was a library filled with research on trans people. And to okay. this day, we haven't really caught up with what was in that. Okay. So, um, and, and you're talking about senators and uh, Congress yeah, people? Yeah, people like that. Okay. Most so those people, uh, conservative pundits, people like that. Okay, so I only have um, a few minutes, but I do want to I want to find a topic, go over it, and then um, I'll research it, and then we'll talk about it more later. But let's um, okay. So what have conservatives? Let's let's leave out the pundits. Let's just say the uh, the uh, senators and people like that. Se senators, members of the house. What what is one right, especially for trans people, you said that um, that they are trying to mm -hmm. strip. I'm just curious if we uh, view it as rights. Um, if they have do. tried to uh, remove the right for people to receive transforming health care. They have tried to make it extremely difficult to get it. OK, so okay. Uh, in, well, hold in on, Texas let me... quite recently, they tried to put together a registry of all the trans people in Texas, which generally is a a sign of bad things to come yeah so that doesn't sound good and i do want to look into that i'm going to make a quick note of that texas trans got it um so i do want to ask you about that first thing you said though uh which i just forgot what was it um uh trying to limit access to transforming health oh that's right okay and are you referring to children or how are they trying to limit it for if you're 18 and above they have tried to do that. That's one that hasn't really stuck because it always ends up getting challenged in state Supreme Courts and the broader, higher level courts because it's unconstitutional. Okay. But uh, when it comes to like kids, mm -hmm. one of the big misunderstandings that people have is that they think that kids are broadly able to get like surgeries and hormones and things like that. And generally, all they could really get their hands on is puberty blockers. And mm -hmm. it's more like after an extensive process of going through doctors and psychiatrists yeah. and like okay. experts in the field. OK, I, I do want to like ask that, you one question. I'm curious about your answer to this, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, what at what age do you think um, top surgery should be able to happen? Just you personally well i think that depends on the medical age of consent because we already have uh like allowed for breast reductions for teenagers who just have boobs that are too big who so aren't what? trans and that's generally not really looked down on top surgery oh, okay. 
So what age do yeah. you think should be the general age of uh, medical consent? Okay, so the general age of medical consent, um, this is going to sound really low, so I'm going to preface it. You're fine. The medical age of consent is low. Like, like for example, in my state, medical age of consent is like 13. And the okay. reason for that is that uh, say that you need a blood transfusion, but your parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're uh, 13 years old, you can go above their head and okay. tell them, like, I don't care. I want this transfusion because I don't want to die. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so then, the like, medical age consent generally is pretty low. I'd say that maybe for surgeries with uh, doctor consultations and proper explanation of possible uh, complications that could happen and things like that, reasonably, as long as you get enough doctors to sign off on it, and it can be deemed to be safe, 15, 16. Okay. Okay. And no, that's, fair. that's, yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay. So uh, here's what I would say. I think that um, actions that can permanently change somebody, that advocating for anything like that to not happen to kids, I would find at very least reasonable. Even if, even if um, that's not the right answer, even if I disagree with that answer, I would say there's a huge difference between um, stripping away the rights to an adult versus a child. Now, let's take something that's very well accepted. I I don't think uh, there's going to be any political push to make it so um, doctors can't prescribe uh, ADHD medicine to children. Now, I don't there think that actually has been over the past okay. 30 years. There's but a, a, big, a big enough one where it enough. would change. Say that one more time. You like, kind of broke up. Oh, I just said a big enough one that it seems like it's po even possible that it would change, or or you just mean a handful of people. I mean that like they have. When I say like a big political push, I don't mean uh -huh. like a big group of people. I mean that there has been concerted efforts to change. That. Oh, okay, so somebody somebody there, uh, wrote some up a bill. We still talk about it. that on the floor, weirdly enough. Okay. So no, yeah. I, and and I agree. And like I I'm on received the, a fair number of votes. Okay. So I'm on the fence, but uh, I would not be against um ADHD medicine being outlawed for children. Um depending uh, I don't know like with if I did a right amount of research I'd change my mind, but I guess what I'm saying is in my mind there is a difference between deciding what an adult can do like saying like having like racist laws or sexist laws or um, preventing people from having the right to do whatever they want, essentially as an adult and people so just, grouping. Just as a note, because I feel like you might not have gotten this coming across. Okay. When I said that like kids not being able to have transforming health, what I mean is that they're trying to keep them from having puberty blockers. And that yeah. is a fairly new push because mm -hmm. we've been using puberty blockers on children since the 70s for schizophrenia. And we know, because there are mountains of studies on this, because they wanted to make sure it was safe, that mm -hmm. there's generally not going to be really effective or lifelong side effects to puberty blockers. Yeah, People will claim that there is when they have political means to do it, but generally there's not really studies to back that up aside mm -hmm. from few that claim that there's like low bone density or something. I don't think there's few. Osteoarthritis, but I think the reason really they... that's not really all that strong. Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty sure it's not few. I think it's uh, based on the time frame. So the reason that you can't be on puberty blockers longer than two years is because of the bone density situation. I don't think that's argued by any political side. It can. It's uh, it's not like set stone, but you know, usually they'll do that just to negate the possibility of the side. Gotcha. But even okay. then, that bone density is the bone density issue is temporary. Okay, L let's assume that um, let's let's assume that that is correct. What I would say, I I think things are complicated when it comes to kids. Uh, okay, so um, like car. Well, sections. you know what? Let's let's make it more simple. Let's huh? stick to the ADHD meds because I actually have a lot of experience. Well, with that. Well, so, I do too. I do too. I um. So here's. I, 
Well, hold on. Let me, say, let me say a okay, thing real ahead. quick. Sorry. I just want to point out, I, I would not judge any politician for wanting to vote against um, anything involving kids. Like there, there, like there's laws for how long a kid should stay in, in a rear facing car seat. And if you watch the images of what happens when somebody that doesn't have a fully developed like neck and all that stuff, get in a car wreck while they're facing forward uh, and how many kids die from it, you see why this should happen. Now the cutoff in our country, I believe is two years. Uh, my kid stayed oh. rear facing till she was like four because it's good to go on even longer. But I, in this, not only do I totally understand the idea of letting parents decide certain things like that, but me personally, I like the idea of forcing um, parents to have these safety precautions for kids based off, uh, based off the science or whatever. And so any topic, anything involving something to do with kids and how they are affected, like harm to them. I, whether it's medications, whether it's vaccines, whether it's whatever, I wouldn't be shocked or bothered by any push, any direction. And I would never view it as a rights element. So no matter what's said, I, I, I don't think negatively about Democrats or Republicans when it comes to the idea of their push, at least for what they describe is based on attempting for what they view as protection so i guess that's just why i'd want to see examples of republicans taking away the rights of somebody 18 or over um so there's that but also i do want to hear what you're going to say i mean about they did that. just remove roe and then in republican states trigger laws went in place that made it so that abortions were either extremely hard to get or outright illegal Ooh, true. No, that's a that's a good that's a good topic to go over. So on on ADHD though, okay, I am totally against them legislating against ADHD meds for kids, and I'll tell you why. Okay. If I didn't have those meds, I never would have made it past like middle school. Never. Oh. Like I I never never like the kids who get wrongfully attributed as having ADHD, it's pretty easy to tell as soon as you put them on the medications, because what happens to them is completely the opposite of what happens to ADHD kids. Those meds are amphetamines, they're stimulants, mm -hmm. hard stimulants. So, and they used to put those in like weight loss stuff. Gotcha. Way back, what, like back when they what, had AIDS. What candy. medication were you so, on as a kid? What happens is, Oh, I was on a ton of them because I oh, okay. would metabolize medication so quickly. I had to go through a bunch of metadate, five ants, concerta. The okay. the list is so long I can't remember. This. But um, generally, what happens with kids with ADHD is those stimulants calm you down. Mm -hmm. They make you able to focus, and they allow you to properly. Uh, they they make you feel motivation. They make it so that you're your um, neuroreceptors pick up dopamine properly so that you can feel motivated to do things you normally would. When kids who don't need them get them, they get very hyper and they get like jittery and they can't really sit still very well and they don't focus as well because they are stimulants and normal people when they take stimulants are stimulated. You know, like I used to, when I couldn't get my pills because they were too expensive, I would bring a Coca-Cola to class with me every day because the caffeine would slow me down. So people with ADHD are affected differently and kids who have it really need it. Like uh, before people were broadly aware of ADHD, like if you ask your parents about it, what they'll tell you, like ask them, was there one kid who always tapped his feet or tapped his desk mm -hmm. and talked to everyone and didn't pay attention? Remember how they used to call that the bad kid? Well, it turns out that kid just needed to be medicated. Those are Ma hallmark signs of ADHD. Okay, well, okay, so let me, uh, yeah, I have a handful of things to say, but I actually do have to get going, but I want to say the things, and I do want to hear your response, but so I was diagnosed with ADHD as a kid, uh, probably around second grade, and I, I was uh, given medication for it, and I went from, I don't know what I was, I was just, uh, I don't know, I was a kid, I ran around a lot, I played soccer, all this stuff, as soon as I started taking the medication, I just turned into a zombie, I just like- You took a riddle in. I would guess. And it they was? probably gave you too high a dose. 
That's right. That's <laughs> usually that's what happens when you take too high. So normally, what they do now because they know more about it, I would, I would wager that that happened in the nineties. Yes, it was nineties, and it was okay. really so, yeah. Right at the time, that was a big problem because doctors didn't have enough experience with it to properly medicate. So they would give you way too much. Yeah, and I was, it would just turn into a drooling zombie. Yeah, as the game. And we found that out when they put me on Ritalin because they went way okay. too high. But as soon as they lowered my dose so that it was proper for my metabolism, it worked mm. like that. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, it kind of messed with me. Uh, but you know, it's, it's whatever. Different people are messed with different ways. I, I will say this, though. I wonder how much it positively affects people in the way our society is set up versus uh, ways people could be in maybe a different setup. You know how you're talking about you think the the family structure of having more family is good and the structure of letting kids um, run around and be wild is good. Well, I I, uh, I like to posit the idea that maybe ADHD is not a bad thing. Maybe, and, and I don't mean bad thing as in you're calling it a bad thing either, but I mean, maybe, maybe it does not need medicated. I don't know about in adults, it's different story. It's whatever, but a kid running around and being wild, it might not be uh, great for them learning and, you know, in school, but I, I feel like I'd rather my kid be running around and happy and learning in well, a different with ADHD, style. ADHD, the problem with that is that the it's not just hyperactivity that expresses mm -hmm. itself through being hyper. The other side of it is that your brain is constantly running all yeah. the time. Not like like especially in my case, I have severe adult type D ADHD qualifies mm -hmm. me for disability. I oh, yeah. have such a hard time clinging to one thing because I have a million things going on in my head so fast. Like, a, and it's not even cogent thoughts. A lot of it is <laughs> sights and smells and memories and dreams oh, and nightmares, yeah. random things all the time. And when I take my meds, it lets me focus. So with ADHD, there's a property called uh, hyperfocus. And what that is, is like, uh, you know, ADHD kids, they can't focus when they're doing the dishes or sweeping a floor. But when you put them in front of a video game or if there's a clock ticking in a quiet room, they'll stare at it for a million years because that's just what your brain decides to focus on. You don't yeah. really control. It. Yeah. And uh, you no, can't really focus. So like, let's say like your kids are running around wild, having fun. It could put you in a lot of danger because you're not paying attention to your surroundings. You're only like halfway paying attention. Yeah. To things. Like I've, I've almost broken things so many times falling into holes i didn't see like uh mm -hmm. not like mine shaft, but you know what I mean? yeah. like, like a like a little divot in the ground that i almost broke my ankle in or falling off of things because i wasn't paying attention properly being yeah. medicated i would notice those things and step around like most people yeah the medications huh. can be very important if you have mild adhd you can learn to handle that on your own if you mm -hmm. have a bad or severe adhd that can be really dangerous like part of the reason that I even ended up breaking my leg recently is because like trying to get home, I had stopped paying attention to the shoulder of the road I was driving on and I didn't notice the grass coming in time. Mm. And I ended up hitting my brakes and putting my foot down because I wasn't thinking about yeah. it. No, that's because a, when you ride motorcycles, they teach you not to put your foot down. I did because I wasn't, I just was working like snap judgment, step my foot down yeah. and I ended up. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I mean, it's, I wonder if like, uh, people that get in car wrecks are more likely to have ADHD because of getting distracted by the sites or whatever. Um, I think it's more that people with ADHD would be more likely to get into car accidents than people who get in car accidents are more likely to have ADHD. Because I think a good portion of the reason that we have so many car wrecks in America is because uh, road rage is a real problem. Yeah. And uh, distracted driving is a serious issue. Yeah. And we don't really require very much competency to get a license. Like yeah, there's that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but hey, I gotta I gotta stop here because I actually really gotta run like fast. I gotta go. But uh it's great talking to you, man. And uh we will set up another talk soon. Sure. I'll see All you. All right, then. take care.